you know, we've been in this series. And we've said, I want to know you. And today, I want to know the real you. I want to know the happy you, the sad you, the wise you, the confused you, the angry you, the peaceful you, the healthy you, the broken you, the spiritual you, the intellectual you, the believing you, the doubting you. But most of all, I want to know the real you. The real you. And so does God. God wants you to be real. Is there an amen to that? Amen. amen. God wants you to be real. And to know the real divine presence. This may be the Sunday before Halloween. <laughs> and there may be lots of stores selling and people talking about costumes and masks. But here's the deal. At this church, you do not need a mask to hide your past or a costume to be acceptable. Amen? Amen? We want to know the real you. The real you. We want to know you on your good days and your bad days. I'm, I'm asking you. Can you say that too? Do you want to know that of each other? To know, just to really know each other, which means I'll love you on your good days and your bad days. Because I know that it's going to change too. We want to know you on your days when you're feeling confident and on the days when you feel unsure. We want to know you as you are right now. Right today, in this very moment. And why is that? Because that's how God knows you. God meets you right where you are, just as you are, and loves you just as you are. Yes? yes. And you don't need to pretend to be anybody else. Just be the you God created you to be. Here's that good news is the real me is love. Turn to somebody, would you, and say the real me is love. Do you mean it? <coughs> Do you believe it? Yes. Not just the, the way you present yourself, but the real me yes. is loved. We are loved by the one who created life. Amen? Amen? Who knew us before we were in our mother's womb. Isaiah 49, 16 says that we were carved, engraved in the lifelines of God's palm. Our our lives are impressed upon God's hands. Our real self is fully known to God and we are loved. We are totally loved. No pretensions. No masquerading. No masks. Yes. Yes. Indeed. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, showed us the real God. No mask, no costume. Jesus showed us the real God, not some religious costume party. Hallelujah. Uh, Jesus, the real word made flesh, lived and walked with real people just like you, who struggled with real issues and sought to find and express real faith. He brought real hope. Do you believe that? And he brought real insight. And most of all, he brought and expressed real love. So for you and I, following in the example of Jesus, following in the path of Jesus, we also strive to embrace one another just as we are. Sometimes that's hard work, isn't it? <laughs> but to be like Jesus is for us to embrace one another right where we are and to truly desire to know the real person. Not the facade someone has to put out or the way they think they have to behave, whether it's in church or in the world, but to seek to understand and really know one another. You know, today we consider the last of the seven statements for ourselves. Today we look at the statement, I am the good shepherd. It's probably the one that is most well known to people. Jesus said, I have other sheep that don't belong to this sheep pen and I must lead them too. Oh, we forget that phrase, don't we? Yeah. Oh, we forget, because we're very busy about who's in and who's out. And Jesus <laughs> says, I have other sheep, and I must lead them too. They will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock with one shepherd. Amen. Amen. That's something to look forward to, isn't it? Yeah. But it's also something to work towards. Jesus welcomed the misfits of his day. The lepers, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the Samaritans, and the Gentiles. Isn't that right? He welcomed them all. Another religion or church may not have accepted you or wanted you in their community. 
They may have wanted you to be someone other than you are. But hear this. Jesus called you and knows you and loves you just as you are. And you and others like you hear the voice of Jesus. The voice of the good shepherd who knows you. And you respond to that knowing. You respond to that voice of love. I am proud, church. I am proud of you. I am proud to pastor a church that welcomes anyone that anybody else might consider a misfit. I am proud for us to follow the example of Jesus. To say straight and gay belong together. Amen? Amen. To say that young and old belong together. Amen? There isn't just a church for those of us who have seen some years and a new church for a younger generation. We have things to learn from one another and learn together. It's not just for us to, to create these separations, but for us to all find our way into the one fold. All levels of physical and mental health, too, belonging together in one community. Mature believers and seekers, amen? amen. Everyone is welcome. The real you is welcome here. Amen. Believe it. And if you're not liking who somebody else is, you just have to kind of deal with it. Because <laughs> God loves them. Amen. We always say, what are you going to do if you die and go to heaven and they're there? Gonna say, I'm not going in. <coughs> so, <laughs> so you could mess up eternity. <laughs> or you could use the laboratory of the church to work on it here Amen. and now. Amen. Jesus showed us how to be like good shepherds. You know, there's no record of Jesus watching over flocks. Is there? Wasn't his career a carpenter? So it's a metaphor. <laughs> Jesus was not a literal shepherd in that sense, but he used a metaphor of the day. There is plenty of record of him watching over his close friends and his followers. There's plenty in the record of how he cared for friend and foe, for women and men, for young and old, for the good people and the bad people, the people that had gotten in trouble, for the healthy and for the ill. There's plenty of record of Jesus caring for that. Jesus cared for the expected flock and the unexpected flock. True or true? true. And they came together into one flock intended by the Good Shepherd. Jesus made the claim that he was the Good Shepherd. But what was he exactly saying when he made that claim? What is a shepherd? The modern day equivalent would be like doggy daycare. But what would a shepherd look like in Jesus' time? The basic function of a shepherd, to care for a flock of sheep, seems pretty simple. But the everyday tasks make it a bit more complicated. Every day a shepherd needs to lead his flock near green pastures where they can safely graze. If they don't eat every day, they'll starve. Now, when Jesus referred to shepherds, he was referring to shepherds of Israel. When I think of green pastures, I don't think of Israel. I think of Ireland. Israel is desert. It's hard to find green pastures. If it wasn't hard enough finding green pastures, a shepherd's leading a flock of sheep. Sheep have great peripheral vision, but when it comes to depth perception, they can barely see beyond their nose. If a shepherd isn't careful, a sheep could literally walk right off of a cliff. The sheep need to rely on their sense of hearing, and a shepherd needs to lead his sheep with his voice, calling out to his flock. Part of being a shepherd is risking your life, giving up your life to defend your flock against threats. Threats against sheep could be wolves or bears or lions. Could be bad weather. Could even be a bad shepherd. Jesus makes the claim that he's not only a shepherd, but he's the good shepherd. In the Old Testament alone, there are over 60 references to shepherds. Some are prophesying the coming of Christ, and some are referring to the character of God and how he cares for us. While others yet are referring to leaders of that time, such as King Solomon or King David or Moses. Sadly enough, some are referring to people that have led the Israelites astray. 
as we read in Jeremiah 50 verse 6, my people have been lost sheep, their shepherds have led them astray. In Isaiah chapter 9 verse 16, those who guide this people mislead them, and those who are guided are led astray. When Jesus was making the claim that he was the good shepherd, he was distinguishing himself, saying that he is the shepherd that will not lead them astray. He's the shepherd that has their good intentions in mind, and he cares for them. He was quite literally saying, I will lay down my life for you. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into some detail on this uh, passage. You're familiar with it, and that little video gave you quite a bit of information on the passage itself. I want you to understand that when Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, that it was a radical and somewhat critical statement. We just use it as a comforting statement, you know. But it was very radical because Jesus, as the good shepherd, stood in contrast to bad shepherds. Did you hear that part? That was, it's not just, I am a shepherd, but I am a good shepherd. <laughs> like, I do my job well. Jesus as good shepherd stood in contrast to those bad shepherds or religious leaders who had led people astray. If we are to follow in the way of Jesus, then isn't Jesus teaching us also to be good shepherds? Do you think? Who care for others? Aren't we called to exercise spiritual leadership and example? Now we talked about this last week when we talked about I am the gate. And it's reinforced here. Again, the point of these metaphors, I am the gate and I am the good shepherd, are not meant to keep us as sheep. Do you think? Some of you would rather be a sheep. Is that true? I'm just yeah. asking. Yeah. Or is it that the radical and critical comment of Jesus' statement for us today is that Jesus is calling us to follow his example. He's teaching by example and saying, look at me. And then be like me. I believe, you see, that we are called to be good shepherds to others. It's not enough for us to simply worship the good shepherd, but to learn from him and be like him. People are hungry for authenticity, don't you think? People are hungry for real spirituality. So the question is, will you lead them to the green pastures of authenticity? Will you love them as they really are? Or do you participate in causing them to have to conform? Mm. Will you leave them in the dry landscape of a dusty and costumed religion? Or do you invite them to the green pastures of a living, nurturing spirituality in a real God who wants to know real people? Sometimes we think that's the job of the pastor, but the pastor's job is to equip the people for the work of the church. <laughs> so when we talk about good shepherds, it's not just our job, and thank you, church, even in pastor appreciation, when you've said we were good shepherds, thank you for that affirmation. But it's really our job is to raise a whole bunch of shepherds. A whole bunch of shepherds. So I'm going to ask you, will you protect people from bad shepherds as well as from the thieves and threats that would steal their authentic selves, their authentic souls, causing them to wither behind the all-too-available masks and costumes of a consumer culture and politically marketed version of Christianity? Isn't there a lot of that out there today? Don't we confuse what we hear in the media with what Jesus really said? I believe that every one of these I am statements is not only about Jesus, but is, an is not only an expressed aspect too of the divine presence that is made flesh in Jesus, but I believe that they are divine invitation to you and I to reclaim our real sacred way as children of God. I think they're radical in that way. To transform us. To invite us to be bold enough when we say that we're Christian to really mean that we're following the way of Jesus, which means the example of Jesus. We follow his teachings and his life example. We don't just talk about him. Come on now, church. And there are an awful lot of people talking about Jesus. 
So for you and I, this is that uncomfortable world. This is why some people don't like to come to church, amen? Want to come to church for a lot of affirmation. But this is sometimes the uncomfortable word when we're told we need to be like Jesus. So it challenges us not to just talk about Jesus and sing songs about Jesus, but to really learn from him and embody it in ourselves. To be the real us. The I am of eternity. God who said, I am who I am invites us to be, I am who I am, who God made me to be. Do you hear it? Do you understand yourself as a reflection of the divine, I am who I am? Can you say, I am who I am, and I stand in my authenticity as who God made me to be? In all areas of your life, in all areas of your life, you are divinely inspired, wonderfully and fearfully made, beloved and called children of God. Can you claim that identity? Yes. Amen. You know, Marianne Williamson said, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? <laughs> Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small doesn't serve the world. Is there an amen to that? There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. Is there an amen to that? It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we're liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Isn't that good news? Isn't it good news? Do you believe that? So I want to say to your church, stand tall and strong in the power of the teaching of Jesus. I want you to hear this poem from Jim Burklow. He uh, had this posted on progressivechristianity.org on uh, May 21st of this year. And Jim wrote, I am, said God to Moses from the burning bush. I am the light of the world. I am the way. I am the gate. I am the vine. I am the bread. Before Abraham was, I am, said Jesus. And when the light went dim, and when the way was run, and the gate was left open, and the vine was wilted, and the bread was eaten, what remained of him was, I am. I am a body. I am a personality, defining a name. I am a member of a tribe. A faith, a family, a profession. I am all these identities and more. But when all my identities pass away, what will remain of me will be I am. Church, learn the lessons Jesus taught and embody the truth of your calling. I want to encourage you to boldly say and claim, I am resurrection and life. Ask yourself, are you? Do you bring life to others or do you suck the life out of them? Which do you want to be? Oh, see, behold, I set you life and death. Choose. <laughs> I am resurrection and life. Do you bring divine hope and resurrection possibilities? You can in the strength of God. Boldly say and claim, I am bread for the world. Share your faith. Share divine wisdom. Feed others spiritually. Amen? Amen? The invitation of Jesus is not simply for us to receive, but for us to receive and go and feed. Amen? Amen. Boldly say and claim, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
Some of you are like, oh, I can't do that. That's about Jesus. I just cannot do that. But again, I'm going to say, if we are to be like Jesus, ask yourself if your life's reflecting the teachings of Jesus. Do you point the way to the divine presence? Does your life point others towards God? Do you live in the truth of love, divine love, that brings others to Christ? Do they see God reflected in you? You can be the way, the truth, and the life. You can. Boldly say and claim, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. If you are connected to the divine vine, okay, are you following me? If you are connected to the divine vine, then aren't you part of the true vine? Then why do we say, oh no, that's Jesus, and I'm over here. And then we study all these things about I'm, I'm grafted onto the vine, or I'm part of the vine, and then we do this separation. Do you understand that we do that with ourselves? Jesus invites us to be part of the, of the true vine. And if I am, then I can say, I am the true vine. We are connected, inseparable. I'm inseparable from God. Isn't that a spiritual truth? Wouldn't a sprout that springs off of your branch also be part of the true vine? It would be divine life. It just happens to be coming off of a place where you shared your faith. But it too would be part of the true vine. Yes? I want you to boldly say and claim, I am the light of the world. You know, Jesus taught us that together we are like a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. And we gotta, we gotta let our light shine. We're gonna sing that a little later in service. We gotta, we gotta let our light shine. Why? Because that's what we're meant to do. That's part of being the real you, is to let the light of love shine within you. It's the light that's within us. And it does not serve the world for us to try and put it under a bushel. Amen? Amen. The divine light of love and truth is within you. Let it shine. It's God's light. Why would you want to hide it? So if it's God's light, can't I say I am the light of the world? Because I know it's not mine anyways. <laughs> it's God's light that's in me. Amen? Amen? It's not heresy. It's actually truth. Boldly say and claim, I am the gate. Which means be willing to lay down your life for another. <clears throat> This is the essence of love of neighbor, isn't it? That we would protect our neighbors and they're coming in and they're going out. That we would stand for justice, care for the flock. So boldly say and claim, I am the good shepherd. I protect the fold. The voice of the divine shepherd is heard through me. Yes? It's the voice of God that's heard through me. It's not my voice. It's the voice of God through me. And I want you to look around. Just look around this room for a minute. Take, turn around. Look, look at somebody. You're not being rude. Just look at somebody. I want you to know, these are your sheep. <laughs> this is your flock. And when you leave church today, if you go out to lunch, if you go home, look around. Everybody you see. From the grocery store clerk, to the person that waits table, to a bank teller. Everyone you see is part of your flock. Why? Because these are all people who matter to God. And if they matter to God, they should matter to us. They may be sheep like you, or they may be other sheep. Hello. <laughs> and you can be a good shepherd to the other sheep who are different than you. Yes? By being a gate to inclusion and letting the light of love shine and grafting others to the true vine of life and showing them the way, the truth, and the life and nurturing and sustaining them with the bread of life which will bring resurrection and life. Do you get it? The whole thing goes together. And it's not just about Jesus. It's about the real you. Every time you say, I am, in a, I am in a sentence, you actually are reinforcing or sending a confirmation to your brain about your self-understanding. You get that? 
So some of you practice affirmations, right? And you say positive things about yourself to send a, a, a confirmation to your brain about how you truly feel or how you want to feel and we can talk ourselves into a new way of feeling, yes? It's also a way of talking about what we expect. So physiologically and spiritually, we are actually telling every cell of our body how to respond in the course of our day. And I'm telling you, you can be the real you. And you can be the real you that is fully connected to the real God. And you can live life with, in partnership with the real divine presence and with real abundant life. And we can tell ourselves these I am statements so that I know that I am one with God. I am one with Jesus instead of Jesus being way separate over there. Unattainable. It is another way of understanding that this is the temple of Christ. Yes? If this is the temple of Christ, if the Holy Spirit is within me, then once again, it's not heresy. It's not egotistical to claim your divine identity and to tell yourself your divine identity. Instead of telling yourself all the messages of the world, tell yourself the messages of love that God's been telling you. Amen? Do you hear that? Claim your I am statements and live into your real self, your divine self, your divine identity of being one with God and one with each other. I am who I am invites you to say, I am who I am. A reflection of the divine. Amen. 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 I'm going to ask you to turn over those little sheets that I gave you and have a look at your I am statements. Each week in this series we gave you the opportunity to say where you were on the journey and there was a number of different options there because sometimes we weren't ready to claim it fully. We were partly on the way. I'm cha challenging you today to move yourself forward but I want you to check the statements that you feel comfortable checking. The ones that are true for you today. And yes, it's on the back side of your comments about the church. So when you hand it in, there's no names. It's going to let me know kind of where you're at. It will help me as a pastor know where you're at. But if you want, you can also take one home. And challenge yourself to say the seven I am statements. Imagine saying that to yourself as an affirmation for the day. And connecting yourself with God with Jesus, connecting yourself with I am. Take a look at those prayerfully. Be honest, because this is about authenticity. It's about the real you. And it is an invitation to live into the divine you. Amen.